Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Brookhouse, and welcome back to the Class Play on the Sumer Sports Show. With free agency in full tilt, we're beginning to see how teams' offseason plans are playing out. Today, we'll go division by division, investigating the moves that teams have made and what they say about how they may approach the draft. Today, I again have $100 million guaranteed contributors with me, <laughs> Ben Brown and Tej Seth. Tej currently has a piece up on SumerSports.com about how teams acquire players and how that affects the offseason. How's it going, Tej? Great, Sam. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I think uh, the contract that you gave me to come on here has a lot of void years in it. So, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we can spread out some of my guaranteed money, but it's not nothing like Ben where you want him for the short and long term, I think. Also joining us as always, Ben Brown. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing well, guys. Yeah, I uh, I don't have any sort of guaranteed dollars joke here, unfortunately. I don't know if I can agree with uh, Tasia's uh, cap implications, basically, for this podcast. But I think we're building to uh, uh, maybe some sort of dynasty or something here coming up over the next couple of years. So it'll be good. But yeah, I'm just appreciative being here. Uh, happy to be here, Coach. Awesome. And so th thank you, guys. And to the Members of the audience, as always, if you're listening, make sure to hit us with some comments. We'd love to answer any questions as we're going along and, and feel free to participate and we'll tag you in uh, where we can. So let's start off with the NFC East, guys. Um, looking at Dallas, Dallas obviously lost Dan Quinn to Washington, who we'll get into in a second. Seems like they're standing pretty pat um, wh where they stand. Obviously, they're They've been very successful in the draft as a result, have a lot of big, big extensions coming up. Also looking at New York, New York is obviously looking to acquire a bunch of people, um, bounce back from last season, very similar, lost a, a major name in free agency to an NFC East uh, uh, competitor. Um, I like some of the things they've done with Drew Locke, bringing in kind of a, a swing backup quarterback that could probably fill in. Obviously a big trade for Brian Burns. Um, that'll be great, uh, but they're kind of still in that rebuilding phase. I'm excited to see, but the big movers in the NFC East, Tej, obviously one was Philadelphia. How do you feel about Philadelphia? So I, I liked most of the moves that Philadelphia made. Bryce Huff, I think, is a very efficient pass rusher, and I know that they're going to be asking him to take on more of a role than he had played in the past, but you know, I really trust the, the projections that the Eagles do, and I, I think that he should be able to fill in as an edge rusher role really well. Devontae Parker is a great wide receiver three slash four type signing where you just want bodies at, at that position and don't want to have to put um, you know, someone like Zacchaeus or Leo Jones like running the majority of your routes. You want to spread those out so you can get juice at that position. Bring back CJ Gardner Johnson from Detroit to to kind of replace him or to replace Kevin Byard. You know, you get uh, four years younger at the safety position. And, you know, I think this is just opening up for the Eagles to, to look into more defensive backs, especially cornerback. And, you know, if Howie Roseman breaks his precedent of going non, uh, you know, offensive defensive line in the first round, I think this might be the year where they actually do take a corner in the first, just to kind of shore up that back seven that they have there. I know they're looking, I know Philadelphia is looking to kind of bolster their pass rush, um, bring in some edge rushers. I know they're looking to move off of Hassan Reddick and a couple a couple other people that have been rumored, of course. Um, Zach Bond, I think, was a, a good bring in at a, at a pretty cheap price. He, he was pretty productive down the stretch for the Saints last year. Um, and then obviously Bryce Huff, another defensive pass rush specialist. Um It'll be interesting to see how those guys turn out. And obviously, uh, the Eagles have done very well with their player acquisition strategies. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that goes moving forward. And now kind of the, the ma massive mover in the NFC East. Uh, Washington made a ton of moves, brought in a ton of big names. Ben, what were your thoughts on Washington? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fairly obvious, uh, you know, Washington is beefing up, obviously, you know, uh, interior offensive linemen, uh, you know, you know, I, I would say in some ways, like what they did with Austin Eckler and Marcus Mariota as well. 
I think probably signifies their approach, especially with what they're going to do at the top of the draft, number two overall. I think in some ways you have seen, I would say the betting markets respond to what Washington did do in free agency. And I think it makes a lot more sense for them to kind of at least have honed in on uh, Jaden Daniels at the number two overall selection. I do think in some ways, um, you know, there's maybe still the possibility of them going up to one and, and getting Caleb Williams, but it very much seems like Drake may is kind of like the piece of the puzzle that no longer fits just based on this most, most, most recent kind of team building, I, I would say, kind of approach to what they did. So I think they're going to run, try and run the football, um, you know, win defensively and, and in a ground and pound attack. And I do think that, you know, a, a Jaden Daniels type player at quarterback makes a lot more sense than Drake may, I would say, in that sort of offense. So I, I think in some ways it indicates their hand for where they're going to go in the draft. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, the betting market response to it uh, makes a lot of sense from my perspective. Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely on board. And it's clear that the new ownership obviously made a, if, if you're an NBA fan, that, that ownership group made a big investment in analytics at the 76ers. They made a big investment uh, with the commanders. And you see some of these names. There are a lot of names that analytics, Twitter and bloggers and stuff have brought up, like Frankie Louvu, Dorrance Armstrong, obviously close ties with Dallas as well, with Dan Quinn coming over. Um, a lot of kind of poaching, one could say, or, or, or pulling from from that well. Um, but I'm very, very interested. The Washington's certainly put their name uh, on on a team to watch moving into the upcoming season. So mo moving from the NFC East to the AFC East, um, two more teams that kind of stood pat: Buffalo, obviously, uh, building around Josh Allen. Uh, we saw them bring in Trubisky as a backup, kind of stand pat with, you know, A.J. Apensa and kind of the D-line. Um, I'm looking at them to kind of build on the margins. You know, they have a pretty good team. They've competed for several years, buffering depth at DB, defensive tackle, wide receiver, obviously. Um, I'm interested to see where they go there. Similar case for New England, but on, on the other side, I think New England stood pretty much pat. Their defense obviously has a lot of talent and, and has been built up and with – the new coach coming in, obviously, they're still going to have that kind of defensive minded Belichick style on that side of the ball. But it's been interesting to see how they they're going to build up towards this number three pick. I mean, they brought in Jacoby Brissett, uh, obviously a great backup quarterback, one of the better ones in the league. I think that's going to set them up very nicely to get a quarterback, whether that's May, Daniels, uh, low chance that it's Williams, but anyone else at that kind of three slot, I think. Uh, I don't know if y'all agree with me, guys, but uh, this pretty much sets them to take a quarterback with with number three. And I, I'm excited to see what they kind of do moving past that in the draft of, of how they focus on the offense. But I think that's going to be their main play. Um, so looking at the other teams in the East, Miami, obviously in an interesting cap situation. Ben, what are your thoughts on how Miami uh, approached the last couple of days and how they're going to move forward into the draft? Yeah, I think it makes sense. You know, obviously, you know, they are cutting in some ways salaries that um, aren't really or trying to get move on from salaries that aren't really reflective of the direction that they want to take the team. So, you know, not making a huge priority of resigning Christian Wilkins, you know, releasing Xavier and Howard, um, you know, letting Andrew Van Ginkle walk, Robert Hunt as well. Like they in some ways, you know, the what they brought in isn't going to make up for what they have lost. So I do think figuring out at all what, what they have in the draft. I do think Jordan Poyer is kind of an interesting piece, um, you know, to, to their back end. Um, where they kind of end up from a secondary standpoint, I think makes a lot of sense. I don't know how I feel, I would say, in particular about the John o. Smith signing. Um, I, I think if you are kind of allocating cap dollars to certain positions that maybe wouldn't have been like the spot that I would have want to emphasize, but I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm concerned about, I would say a few teams in the AFC East. And I do think the dolphins are, are kind of front and center to where they might not live up to um, live up to kind of those like betting market expectations next season is kind of my uh, initial read on the direction for where they've headed post free agency. Yeah. And, and coming off of that pr prediction, looking at a team that hot, had those high hopes and didn't necessarily live up to them last year, uh, we have the New York Jets. Obviously, we're supposed to be having Rodgers coming back off an Achilles. Um, their defense was was pretty darn good last year, and frankly, without that defense, I don't think they would have even had the record they had. Um, Tej, what are your thoughts about what the Jets have done to kind of 
you know, go into the next year with Rodgers, maybe a slight reset. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think Ben did a really good job of laying out like why Miami might have to take a step back next year just as the function of the players that they lost in free agency versus what they brought in. And I think the Jets are kind of at the opposite point of that where they want everything to happen for them next year, um, you know, in regards to to being able to compete for the division for the Super Bowl. And they kind of want to build a roster around that. And I think, you know, it's really important to go out and get to Rod Taylor and like have a, an actual backup quarterback this year. If Rodgers misses a game or two, you know, he has a minor finger injury or, or something along those lines. Like that's someone that can come in and as long as they're healthy as well, like win that game for you if needed, like coming in at halftime. Like I didn't really think Zach Wilson was was that type of quarterback. Um, you know, Javon Kinlaw, I thought was was about on market, you know, for the some of the projections for him. And obviously losing Bryce Huff, you know, you hope by spending as much draft capital as you have, on edge rushers, you can kind of build that up with someone like Will McDonald next year. So, and I think it comes down to, are they going to sign Tyron Smith, uh, you know, to kind of shore, shore up that other tackle spot, you know, pretty good trade trading with the Ravens today for, for their, their first tackle. Um, because then I think that opens up wide receiver or even tight end in the first round for them. If not, if they don't end up going through with that signing, I think that they will end up you know, drafting a, an offensive lineman in the first round, it just seems like the right thing to do. And, you know, they're hoping that they can get their like Tristan Wharfs in the year that the the Bucks won the Super Bowl when Wharfs was a, a rookie out of whatever rookie offensive tackle they end up taking. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I think we've done so much work the last couple of weeks on looking at the combine. And frankly, I've been pretty impressed with those kind of first round offensive linemen. Obviously, we don't want to let the combine kind of bias us too much. But it's a it's a it's a great time to kind of understand who's in the in the market and really do a deeper dive. And it, it'll be very interesting to see if they sign uh, Teron Smith or if they go with a, with a, you know a young offensive lineman in that Werfs mold in, in Rogers last year or two. Um, we'll see what they do. But obviously, I think a little bit more focus on the offense for the Jets will be great. And, you know, who we'll see what happens. And I think their cards are kind of all out on the table. And I think they gave us a really good sense of, of what they're going to we'll have a really good sense after free agency about what they plan to do. So moving down to the NFC South, uh, we have New Orleans, New Orleans, obviously well known for their cap strategy. Uh, not a ton of movement bringing in Willie Gay, obviously a good backup uh, to kind of their Pete Werner. Typically, they'll play two linebackers their best years they've had three linebackers uh notably in the last couple of years obviously they have Nephi Sewell now uh used to have Quan Alexander I think now that they have you know Sewell they have Pete Werner they have Demario Davis uh bringing in Willie Gay I think they have a lot of options for what they can do um kind of moving into the offseason uh with those four um obviously they lost Jameis which we'll which we'll talk about uh when we get to Cleveland um, as a Saints fan, that's that's a person I'm going to miss. Obviously brought a lot of energy. But I think uh, looking at the Saints in terms of what they may do for the draft doesn't really show us exactly what they will do. Um, but I expect them to to go look, looking at where they can fill in, where they can get young depth. Obviously, that's going to be their um, – that's going to be their focus given that some of those guys are getting up in age. I think they do have a lot of talent. Um, but young depth is key, key for them. Similar spot for Tampa, obviously Tampa locked in with Baker, which I was really excited about. I, I kind of took my final victory lap on my, on my Baker prediction that he's, he was going to be a pretty good quarterback last year and it obviously paid off for him big time. Uh, Mike Evans, obviously coming back, he'll have, he'll have his top weapon. Um, and they pretty much st stood pat with signing, you know, Levante, David, Greg Gaines, Chase Edmonds. Um, I think they're in a similar position, given to have an aging team with a lot of talent, young depth, um, interior offensive line, maybe edge rusher with Shaquille Barrett outgoing. You know, I think I think they're in a similar spot as the Saints and kind of soft launching this take. Uh, but I think the NFC South is going to be pretty good next year, though you may not recognize it because I think they may just split games with each other. And so moving into the two teams that we have seen a little movement from, uh, Tej, let's hear about Carolina a little bit. 
I love the NFC South is underrated take. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you've really seen this transition where you nailed your Baker evaluation last year. Now you're seeing some of these other teams, you know, make some, some good moves. And like, I think Carolina is one of these moves. Like the Deontay Johnson trade is awesome. Like I know that you gave up a, a starting level corner, but it, he's a separator. You know, he's someone that ranks top 10, whatever separation metric you want to look at consistently. And I think that he's going to provide that for this Panthers offense, Robert Hunt, um, you know, you could you could say it's a slight overpay, but like you want to bring in players like Robert Hutt, like Damian Lewis, where you just shore up those guard spots, you increase your your floor in the run game, and then you also help Bryce Young navigate the pocket a little bit better. Um, you know, they they've really sacrificed some of their defensive pieces to build up their offense, and I think that's the right move because next year is all about developing your young quarterback, and that's why I'm thinking that the Panthers will end up going and spending either picks. 33 and 39 on wide receivers and, you know, maybe another offense lineman or they spend 33, uh, you know, on, on a wide receiver, 39 is, is some type of defense just so they can, they can build up, uh, you know, some of the defensive line, but so many options in, in the spot that they're picking at, at wide receiver, AD Mitchell, Keon Coleman, Xavier Worthy, Lad McConkey, like one of those guys will be there. And I think that the Panthers can put out a, a pretty decent supporting cast for their offense this upcoming season. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there in terms of this wide receiver class. Obviously, a lot of hype about this wide receiver class. I think uh, the deeper they go, uh, like the, I think given that they have a, a high first round, excuse me, high second round pick, I think that'll basically end up being like, you know, quote, a late first round pick for them where they may be able to grab a top wide receiver talent. Um, and it'll also be interesting to see with a lot of people outgoing in terms of defense, what they do there. Um, but it, it, looking at Atlanta, Ben, obviously you're a big Minnesota fan, Kirk Cousins going to Atlanta, leaving Minnesota. What are your thoughts on their kind of plan as a whole and what you think they're going to do in the draft? I think we're having a little technical difficulty. Ben, we can't hear you. Can you uh, snap back on? Snap back on. Kirk just sometimes puts me on tilt and I uh, just mute myself because I'm going to go crazy. Uh, <laughs> it went off. But yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, going to the actual discussion with Kirk Cousins, like, you know, it to me, it is in some ways difficult to, you know, really put a quality team around a Kirk Cousins type contract. In a lot of ways, that's why we're seeing, you know, I would say NFL teams kind of go in the opposite direction where they're prioritizing top end quarterback play at the top of the draft and trying to figure out the rest later. The Falcons, you know, previously haven't really gone in that direction, you know, with, with valuing Kyle Pitts and Bajan Robinson. And, and in some ways, the new regime is maybe buying into that a little bit to the point where they think they can put. I would say a, a young nucleus around Kirk Cousins where they could be really good. But I think it does set them up kind of like you guys said uh, to make the NFC South really competitive. To me, the Falcons do look like legitimate playoff contenders. Um, you know, in the NFC, the question obviously is like, can they get to the Super Bowl? And I think in some ways that's going to dictate, you know, what they do or what they prioritize in the draft. It does seem like, you know, going the Kirk Cousins route and the fact that it, we're, we're, we're trending in the direction where there's going to be four quarterbacks, maybe in the first four picks, but if not, you know, a, above pick eight for Atlanta, like that sets up really well for them to get, you know, one of, you know, the three wide receivers or really their choice at edge and Dallas Turner or, you know, Gerard, Gerard Vars, or, you know, uh, their choice at offensive tackle, if they kind of want to at, at least provide some depth to Jake Matthews as he, you know, transitions into like the twilight of his career. But I think overall, like, it would be really intriguing if they added one of these three, you know, wide receivers, whether it's Rome, Maduzne, you know, or, or Malik neighbors drops a little bit. Um, you, you know, I do think there should be an expectation that one of these three receivers does slide. And if they do, I, I think the Falcons could be, a, you know, a, talked about or written about as like one of the most exciting or hyped up offenses this offseason if they kind of go in that direction of the draft. And I think that is probably the best long term scenario, um, you know, from a roster building standpoint. Two years. It's two long years, though. That's why <laughs> yeah, they got the offense right away is like the thing, right? So, yeah, and I think interestingly, signing Kirk, I think gives them the 
from a from a kind of scouting talent evaluation of self scouting gives them a ton of options for what they can do because realistically they should know what guys they have uh and, and whether they're guys that should be considered extended whether traded things like that like we'll in theory know the value of those players given what we know about Kirk Cousins obviously we've seen him be very successful with young guys like TJ Hawkinson Justin Jefferson so forth and so on in terms of that offense we should know if Kyle Pitt like we should finally know if Kyle Pitts is is an impact player obviously it seems like Drake London is an impact player they they bought low on someone like Darnell Mooney who I played with I, I think he's a really good player uh was a, a little he wasn't used probably as much as I think the Falcons probably value him at. They probably see him as an undervalued player. Bringing him in, I think you'll get to know very quickly if he's an impact player. And then obviously, wherever they go in the first round, um, whether that's offense or defense, I, I think they have a real need at edge. Um, but but we'll see what happens. And, and you know, within a year or two, we'll know if Atlanta's a, a team to beat or not. And, and obviously, they'll be able to make decisions based off that. A, a lot of it. I think was hindered by the quarterback position in the past where they didn't really know what they had. And I think that problem has now been solved. So moving on to the AFC South, um, Indianapolis obviously was in a position last year where the quarterback was out uh, for most of the year. They let Gardner Minshew, who was there probably going into this year would have been their backup. They let him walk, um, re-sign Grover Stewart. Uh, I think they have a pretty good young team and we'll see what they end up doing in the draft. I'd expect them to go edge at least somewhere in with their, with their top uh, few picks. Um, Tennessee, obviously on another end from an ascending team, Tennessee has been, you know, scrapping it out to try to compete the last couple of years. Um, we, we let them see big names like Derek Henry, Danico Autry walk. Um, it, I think they have a, a, a lot of places where they could go in the draft. I don't know. This is one of the teams where I think their moves made it a lot murkier on what their draft strategy will be. But I'm I'm pretty certain that that front office, given their commitment to analytics and, and kind of bringing in some new guys, I, I'm sure they have a path forward. It's just not evident um, by what they did in free agency. And I think that's probably because they have a younger team and are pro coming off a, a several years of, of really trying to compete and, and not getting all the way there. But looking at Jacksonville, Tage, what were your thoughts on some of the things that they've done? Yeah, so putting together some of the pieces with what Jacksonville has done in free agency, I think the Gabe Davis signing three years, 39 million, is interesting because you want to kind of see how a, a true deep threat you know, someone who can play vertically with a with a strong vertical route tree looks in that offense where Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram, who I think are both really good at what they do, can work underneath based on that. Like, you know, when I've chosen Gabe Davis as my first option for that, I probably would have leaned like someone like MVS. But I can kind of see the, the vision that they're putting together in the receiver room. And then obviously continuing with that, Ridley is kind of, you know, still, I think, deciding, uh, you know, whether he wants to go to, back to Jacksonville or, or take another team's offer if, if it's available to him or, or even more money. So, you know, we'll see how that all looks. If, if Ridley comes back, I think that's like a heck of a pass catcher group. I assume Zay Jones would, would catch a stray, um, you know, from that. But like that, that's a really good group to build around. You know, they, they tried to uh, kind of like shore up their offensive line, getting, getting Mitch Morris and then, you know, tried to also get a little bit more help in the secondary with Donald Savage and Ronald Darby, but I don't think they'll be truly set at secondary until after the draft. I think that quarterback should and probably will be the move for them in the first round. And I think like if Ridley does not sign with them, you know, you start to think a little bit more about pass catcher being an option, but you know, probably not something at the, the top of their list with some of the other holes they have, uh, you know, in the secondary and, and even like the offensive line. Yeah, definitely. I, I think they're kind of in a flip of what Atlanta is in where they, you know, they think they have a franchise quarterback, a young franchise quarterback. They're really investing uh, in wide receivers. It'll be interesting to see what ends up happening with Calvin Ridley. Um, but I think that Trevor Lawrence should have a, a plethora of weapons and we'll see if he can get it done. Uh, uh, moving on to another team with a young quarterback, Houston obviously overachieved what many expect last last year. Um, ben, what are your thoughts? Obviously, they made kind of a lot of incoming moves. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, obviously really exciting. There are, I think, you know, we always talk about like championship windows and those sorts of things and when should teams press their edge. But I do think if you have a rookie quarterback that has shown that he can be as good as CJ Stout in his rookie year, like this is kind of how you go all in around him, right? And I think in some ways, you know, they're pretty strong at receiver. Maybe they need a little bit of depth at that position, but overall have some top end guys as well. So going out and getting, you know, Daniil Hunter, makes a lot of sense, especially if he fits within D'Amico Ryan's like overall vision for how they want to construct a defense. Like they are in some ways building up at key positions and have the luxury to do so. And, and then in some ways are, you know, taking shots on guys like Jeff Okuda, who I know, you know, Tej has thinks, you know, probably isn't going to pan out whatsoever <laughs> and probably rightfully so. But I think in some ways just adding like depth at, you know, these weak tail type positions does make a lot of sense to a similar thing with Michael Ford. So I like what they did along the edge. I do think they added a ton of pressure type numbers to their defensive line through free agency. And I think like, you know, their position to, um, you know, not only really challenge for the AFC South this year, but I think kind of make a name for themselves in the AFC at large and could be that team that, that is kind of in contention with the Kansas City Chiefs to potentially get to the Super Bowl in the next couple of seasons. Yeah, I looking at their moves, my initial thought is all things considered, and if all things go well, that defensive line is is scary. I mean, you're having Daniil Hunter, who's been immensely successful when healthy, Will Anderson, who was an absolute beast last year, Danico Autry, who I believe led the tit- Titans in so- sacks last year. Obviously, he's a little older, but you you have those three guys in in a Debico Ryan's led offense. Uh, excuse me, defense. And that's really bolstering that defensive side of the ball in support of a young quarterback who, you know, maybe the league catches up to him in, in, in a certain way, the tapes out on him. Obviously there's a lot of adjustments with the new staff and quarterback last year that teams may have not had the tape. Uh, I wouldn't expect that, but it'll be really interesting to see as was just brought up, how they approach a little harder schedule uh, coming off of a playoff run, some guys coming back, but, in the draft, it'll be really interesting to see where they go kind of now that, you know, they're a, they're a marked man that, or, or a made man. They're someone who's made the playoffs with a, with a quarterback that people are really big on. Moving on to the NFC West, obviously we're looking at teams like Arizona, Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco. Tej has, is feeling good about where Arizona's at. He, he, he floated some, some uh, takes to me that he think, thinks Arizona may be a sleeper going into next season. Tej, tell us a little bit about the NFC West. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, the reason why I think Arizona is going to be a sleeper going into next year is they have so much draft capital to work with. Like, I love what Monty Osenfort was able to do in uh, last year's draft where, you know, I think he came in, he understood that, you know, they, they only had half of an offseason to prepare for the draft. So, you know, he traded for some future picks and, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before the show. Like we think that teams discount future picks more than they should. And now he has the most draft capital in the entire NFL. Um, you know, whether you use the Fitzgerald Spielberger chart or another chart headed into the, the actual draft here. And I still think on top of that, a trade with the Vikings or another team that wants to come up to four and take the fourth quarterback in this draft, would be mutually beneficial for both teams. So if that's the Vikings coming up, the Cardinals going back and they're picking up, you know, combination of future picks and current picks in this draft and really just building up their draft capital. I think that, you know, even though Marvin Harrison is, is a top wide receiver prospect, they can still get like a, a Roma Dunze, a Malik neighbors, a Brian Thomas jr. And, and have other spots filled. And I think that's kind of what they're setting up for with this free agency, like Justin Jones, Sean Murphy, Bunting, Bilal Nichols, like they don't move the needle a ton. They're, they're, they're good pieces that you can expect like decent level starting play from, but I really think that they're going to go in the draft and just use all the draft picks and all the draft capital that they have to, to really get a lot of these rookies in place and, and, you know, be ready for the, the second half of next year. And then 2025 after that. Yeah. And then looking at team, uh, a team like LA, obviously this has historically been a very competitive um, historically been, a, or at least in recent history, been a very competitive division. Um, L.A. brings in Jonah Jackson from your Lions, Tej. Uh, what are your thoughts kind of on on where they may go from there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think like, you know, to bring in Jonah Jackson to, um, you know, re-sign uh, Kevin Dotson 
you're you're really just building this interior offensive line that is going to be one of the the heavier and and more powerful run blocking units. Like I think they're just they're just going to run duo and just run the heck out of it next year. Um, you know, which I I know you'll like to watch Sam and I think like the other goal is to, like to, to keep Stafford healthy and they know that they can really compete with most teams in the NFC as long as Stafford, Kyron Williams, and Puka Nakua are all on the field. And so I think like when they go into the draft, they had so much young production on defense last year they do have that first round pick this year that I, they haven't had since i believe 2016 2017 so i think they're going to use that on edge or defensive back and just really work to make that defense a, a you know an average level unit and then they're going to hope their stars can carry them on offense yeah that checks out and looking at you know one of their competitors obviously there's the mcfay shanahan rivalry uh looking at san francisco obviously they've reshuffled their d-line a little bit so kind of that that kind of building up of the offensive line for the Rams, obviously that may be a little yin and yang there. Ben, what are your thoughts on San Francisco? Yeah, I mean they're they're kind of in an interesting uh, you know spot. Obviously, like you said, um, you know bringing in Leonard Floyd, uh, you know the marquee signing for them, I think is like noteworthy. Kind of like you said, they lost Javon Klimla, lost some depth along the defensive line as well. Brought in, I would say, more depth than what they lost previously. And I think in some ways prioritize defensively what they need to get right. Um, t- to me, I think, you know, longer term, you know, there's still probably questions about, um, y- you know, like where where does the whole situation with Brandon Ayuk get resolved? Debo Samuel as well, kind of in a similar boat. Their offense has so many questions that I think, you know, prioritizing the defense, although it makes sense, um, you know, makes it seem more like they're all in this year uh, and then going to kind of need to hit the reset button next year, the year after, just based on, you know, overall team makeup and where they're kind of heading from, uh, you know, a salary perspective and, you know, some guys, you know, with like Trent Williams and everyone else potentially leaving or accruing, like they're going to have a lot of movement offensively in the coming years. So I think this is kind of their signal that we're going all in one more time this year. Let's see where it lands. Uh, and then really going to have to figure things out next year with some hard cap decisions, I would say. Interesting. And and then finally looking at the final team in the West, Seattle, obviously they've stood pretty pat. I'd say that they, that at least to me, I haven't really gotten a sense of what they may do in the draft. Tej, what are your thoughts on what they may do in the draft? So I, I think I really think that the first round for Seattle is, is going to be about, you know, getting some pieces in the front seven. Um, you know, they I think they've they've approached this free agency period the right way, you know, shaving a lot of the players that weren't going to really help them in 2025, which is, I think, what they're building for. You know, you think about cutting both the safeties, not bringing back Jordan Brooks, not bringing back Bobby Wagner. Like, I think that the, the back seven is going to be something that they can kind of build um, over time. Obviously, you have your your two cornerstones in Witherspoon and, and Woolen there. So I think that they're going to look towards defensive line um, in the draft and, and you know, try to really supplement that area with how they, they re-signed Leonard Williams and then also, um, you know, build on their their tight end core uh you know after that once they move on from there yeah that makes sense and then moving on to the afc west obviously we start looking at kansas city the champs uh obviously like you look at the people that they have incoming and outgoing there's not a ton of change there uh but obviously the outgoing names are are some names that were that were relevant in the super bowl you know nick allegretti you look at willie gay Obviously, Tommy Townsend, who could have been the MVP of the Super Bowl with that muff punt, you know, like got to get quality, consistent punts and good things will happen. Um, uh, my corollary for them kind of is, is similar to how the Golden State or the San Antonio Spurs dynasty moved along where, you know, guys are coming in and out. But you look over and over again as the season starts and you're like, well, they didn't really lose anybody. And I expect them to actually add some pretty good pieces in the draft, whether that's you know, adding depth on that strong defense, particularly the interior defensive line, obviously brought Chris Jones back, which was which was huge. It'll be interesting to see what they do with Legereus Sneed. Um, trade rumors, obviously galore there, given he's such a valuable asset and performed so well last year. Obviously, that would op- that might open up a need at cornerback. And then also, everyone wants more weapons from Mahomes. Uh, I think that this deep, deep wide receiver even going into the second, third, fourth rounds, obviously they can make an investment there, but it really seems kind of like 
Uh, you know, one year for the for the Golden State Warriors, Jordan Poole is good out of nowhere. And then this year they have two more people that they that they had drafted this year, years prior, that are all of a sudden good. And I'd be really excited to see who that person is for the Chiefs because it seems like they do it over and over again. Moving on to another big name, um, a big name outgoing Denver, obviously paying a huge cost for letting Russell Wilson go. Ben, what are your thoughts on Denver? Yeah, I mean, this was, you know, in, in some ways the discussion of free agency, whether it was worth it or not, right? And very much, you know, cutting, cutting, cutting quickly the, you know, ripping off the bandwaid band-aid in a lot of scenarios. Like it's it's tough to see, you know, the current state of the Denver Broncos roster and be at all bullish about their intermediate or any sort of outlook, right? Because I feel like in every sense of the word, they're kind of stuck in a really poor spot, obviously still paying Russell Wilson out from under him, traded Jerry Judy, who was, you know, going to be an unrestricted free agent next year, but they just don't have a ton of talent on this roster. I would say in a lot of key spots, right? Like I think like Alex Singleton's probably their best player, you know, middle linebacker, basically like they just don't have a ton of guys that really move the needle. And unfortunately, like with their draft pos- draft position at 12th, overall, they kind of sandwiched between teams that, are probably going to go quarterback. So unless they, you know, move up, which they don't have the second round pick either, like they're they're not really going to have a quarterback this year. You know, they're not going to go up and get their guy. So they're looking at defense, solidifying a defense that was, you know, really poor by all intents and purposes. I think the, you know, concerning thing is like Patrick Sertan, like he took a step back overall from a coverage perspective, they're one of the worst teams in football. So maybe they go corner cornerback, but to me, they're in a tough spot from the draft. If they, do want to focus on the needs that they have on this roster and actually getting a blue chip talent in one of the key positions. They're just not set up to do that whatsoever. And I think then, you know, it's maybe an edge rusher falls, maybe it's a cornerback, but this is still a multi-year rebuild that is, you know, still feels multiple years away. Yeah. I I think there's two major points that you hit on there. Obviously the multi-year rebuild, I think Sean Payton, obviously a, 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 huge long contract i think he kind of has the ability to put his fingerprints all over and what really kind of interested me about kind of their approach both the last year and this year obviously last year after you know giving up 70 points to the dolphins everyone thought that this was you know the process the tank year um and it didn't end up going that way they ended up scratching their way into games i i think sean payton really likes to win and, and so it'll be interesting to see if, if you know, as Beat Gamer 99 said, they're just looking forward to 2025 or if, you know, they shake it up or figure out a way to get in that top three. I know there's been some small rumblings about how much Sean Payton loves Caleb Williams. I don't know if that's exactly possible, but I almost wonder if they value that second tier of quarterbacks kind of more than the league consensus is. And I think that's what's really interesting when you look at a guy like, you know, Michael Penix, who avoids sacks at a rate that is is really incredible at the college level. That usually translates. Obviously, Sean Payton had Drew Brees, one of the best sack avoidant quarterbacks, especially late in his career, um, where he, you know, kind of changed his whole game to avoid sacks, avoid negative plays. Uh, I wonder if they don't view a Bo Nix or a a Michael Penix or someone in, in, in that vein as extremely valuable uh, as compared to the rest of the league and think they may be able to buy low for, for a, a big payoff. Um, moving forward into Vegas, Tej, what are your thoughts about what's va- what Vegas has done? I cannot wait to watch Christian Wilkins and Max Crosby on the same defensive line. I think that that run defense is going to be one of the best things that we've seen. Um, but, you know, does, does run defense, you know, necessarily correlate strongly with, with wins? Like that's a different conversation. I think that from a pure football perspective, it's it's going to be fun to watch. You know, I think that they did the right thing in, in letting Josh Jacobs walk as well, especially for the contract that he ended up getting. And I think that like, you know, like we just talked about with Denver, um, you know, Vegas is another one of those teams where they want to be looking towards 2025. Um, you know, you, you start looking towards offensive line. You know, you gave Gardner Minshew the the contract to be your your starting quarterback maybe you you dip into the tier two of the the Rattler Penix Knicks kind of grouping in this draft as well um you know and, and might not necessarily want to take one of the the top four 
quarterbacks and then and then corner I think is also on the table for them so like they, they're more of a blank canvas also and you know I think that them, them in Denver are, are kind of stylistically very similar entering this year where like there's there's obviously no shame in in tanking quote unquote for a year where you can you can kind of like reset some of your your cap help reset some of your draft capital and, and really focus on making a push in the next upcoming seasons yeah, and if, if nothing else, I love the Wilkins move as well because I, I can just imagine some great battles, even though the Chiefs may get the better of them, some great trash-talking battles between Wilkins, Crosby, and Patrick Mahomes. I, I can't wait to see how that plays out. Moving into the final team, which obviously has had a full administration change, moving from Brandon Staley, who at the end of the year almost seemed kind of like a lame duck coach, um, to a just completely different mindset with Jim Harbaugh coming off of an NCAA national title. Uh, you know, he, he loves the heavy packages. He loves big guys on defense. Um, ben, what are your thoughts about how Los Angeles is going to completely change uh, and build around Justin Herbert? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, obviously their cap situation is difficult, right? And they do have a lot of dollars allocated to defensive guys that, you know, for all intents and purposes, haven't really lived up to the hype. We know we're still, I haven't seen, you know, Khalil Max like updated deal numbers for what he's going to be from a cap perspective this year, even like what his restructured contract looks like. You know, they did cut Mike, Mike Williams today. So like they're still trying to find ways to really navigate um, you know, what, what, what has kind of been set up before them. So I don't know. I don't love, I would say the Will Disley signing that they had. Um, I know in some ways they have to figure something out with Gerald Everett, um, you know, moving to Chicago, but, um, I, I, I just think there was maybe a higher priority of going in other directions, but I do think, you know, Gilman specifically, um, you know, I, I think can be a key contributor to their secondary, um, so I like that move. Obviously they're set up really well with, you know, top five draft pick, kind of maybe going to be, um, you know, that one, the the, the team that kind of has their pick of the non-quarterback, which I also think makes that a really valuable pick, um, you know, in other teams' eyes. Or if, you know, the, the quarterback, you know, the Cardinals stand pat and take like a Marvin Harrison Jr., you know, that means like that fourth guy, the, like the, the Chargers are basically going to be um, kind of, I would say, in the driver's seat from the draft draft perspective and i think that it sets up really well and could be a really strong indication to how they're going to approach you know this justin herbert type window that they have but i think you know obviously they they, they still have you know some high-end you know defensive dollars doled out that are just going to be really difficult to overcome but i think if they can find you know a young playmaker in the draft to kind of pair with the veteran presence that they still have in keenan allen and, and really kind of nurse justin herbert along like they at least have outs of being not only a playoff team, but uh, a team that's possible, you know, capable of potentially pulling off an upset still, you know, on the road come playoff time. So uh, although it's, you know, going to be difficult to really see that play out, I do think, you know, longer term, um, there is still an indication where they could at least be relevant in the AFC West discussion, I would say. Yeah, I agree. And so now we move into kind of our final subset of divisions, the NFC and AFC North. Obviously, I think these are two of the better divisions, if not two of the more interesting divisions as well. And obviously, Tej and Ben, y'all are both big fans, grew up watching the NFC North. We're going to we're going to start with Green Bay, obviously a team that if, if not overachieved, achieved up to what was expected of Jordan Love. And then obviously there was there was some great upside with all that other young talent uh, on the offensive side of the ball. Um, Tage, what what are your thoughts about where Green Bay's at? You know, a couple days into free agency, and what that shows about what they may do for the draft. Yeah, I mean, you know, first off, making a, a Lions and Vikings fan talk about the Packers first is uh, is pretty criminal, Sam. But you know, I can talk about it. And I I think that the the Green Bay Packers are like Leonardo DiCaprio, right? Like they just want to be young at every spot that they can be young at, and like that's why you, you make the move of, you know, paying for Josh Jacobs at, at age 26, uh, you know, moving on from Aaron Jones, who had some durability and age concerns. Like, you know, again, like the contract was a little rich to me, but like, I can see why they did it. I could see why they wanted to get younger and, and more durable at running back. Same thing at safety, right? Like you, you let Darnell Savage walk, you bring in Xavier McKinney, you, you pay top dollar for him. And, and you kind of have, uh, you know, that type of player, uh, you know, available to you. I think that when you look at, you know, what this could mean for the rest of their offseason and, and going to the draft, 
Their new defensive coordinator, Jeff Halfley, has, has preached on the importance of having safeties who can cover sideline to sideline. I was talking to my friend Avi about this today. Like, I think that he wants to see the secondary have an overhaul. So I can still see corner or safety on the table. And then because of the Bakhtiari situation, um, and, you know, depending on what ends up happening with, with Elton Jenkins, um, you know, I think that, and, you know, they're losing John Runyon as well. Like I think offensive line will also be a main focus in, in their draft also. And, and then moving obviously to the team with the number one pick, uh, kind of been in the bottom of the NFC North for the past year or so. Um, Chicago obviously has the number one pick. With my, my take on it is that I, I frankly, I'm no longer sure what they will. I came into the week thinking they're 100 percent on Caleb Williams, selecting him, and and now I'm not not exactly sure given where the cards have fallen. Ben, what are your thoughts? That is a good question. I'm still pretty adamant that they're going Caleb Williams. To me. You know, what they end up doing with Justin Fields is kind of like the the pertinent question and what the offers have been. Um, you know, obviously people talk about, you know, the, the market drying up for him in a certain way. I do think it's probably relatively easy to see, like, the you know, the starting quarterback pitcher take shape after a couple pieces kind of fall. And I do still think there maybe are some players for the Justin Fields Um you know, depending on what the compensation is, I don't mind, you know, them hanging on to him and going Caleb Williams. It's still kind of like figuring it out. Cause I do have, you know, like you guys said, a ton of draft capital um, are going to have like a really valuable selection at the number ninth overall pick. If there is the run on quarterbacks, again, kind of going back to it with Atlanta, um, you know, like they're going to be in prime spot to potentially, you know, solidify like the left tackle position, um, you know, really well, uh, you know, they could go edge defender as well at that spot. Um, you know, and they do have Montez sweat after like the in-season trade as well. So I think that they're just kind of like, they're an interesting team. I don't want to say the rebuild is completely over. Obviously having the number one overall pick indicates that moving back, um, you know, like sliding back and getting a huge you know, bounty for that number one overall pick just isn't in the cards. You know, I, based on the direction from what I've seen, like I do think it's either Caleb Williams or they trade out of that pick. Uh, I, I just think that that's still a strong indication. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, Sam, on kind of what changed from last week to this week to maybe lead you to believe that, you know, they, they're they going a different direction than Caleb Williams. Are you saying that they want to go a different quarterback or would they be moving on from the pick in that scenario? Well, yeah, it's it's just very interesting. I, we've seen so much smoke around Justin Fields to Atlanta or Justin Fields to this starting this team that needs a starter. Um, and you just look at like where the leverage sits per se. And obviously, if they have a quarterback on the roster who has you know led them to a seven and ten or or you know just just under five hundred record as he has, does that increase leverage? Um, for, you know, another team jumping up and trying to take that pick, or does that increase demand of the pick? Does it de obviously now that teams have kind of settled on their, their, their quarterback figure, you would think that their leverage is decreasing by the day, uh, by each day that they don't trade Justin Fields, if they are, have already made the decision that they're going with number one, I just think obviously time in any negotiation is a, is a huge deal. And, and, the, the fact that they didn't trade Justin Fields obviously makes me believe that they think they have some other leverage by keeping him on the roster. And I, the only way that that really makes sense is if you're there looking to trade out that number one pick, obviously they've, they've traded back before they may do it again. Um, it'll be very interesting. I, I don't know. This is another team where I, I, I felt like I, I knew what direction they were going and, and people could make projections off of that. Um, and I feel like it's gotten a little bit murkier now, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next two weeks. And so now we're going to turn it to, you know, Minnesota, Detroit, the the Tay Seth and Ben Brown kind of strongholds, perhaps two of the most knowledgeable people on those those two teams. Ben, tell us about Minnesota. Yeah, I would not say that to Vikings Twitter, unfortunately. I know they look at the pitchforks out on you for that, basically. But, um, no, I mean, it's interesting, right? Obviously, the Kirk Cousins is going to dominate the headlines and the discussion. Uh, to me, it was weird because I feel like I was – I became more pro Kirk the longer it went on. And like at, at like the final point, it was like, man, I wish they would just run it back for one more season and, and kind of see where it's at. Cause I don't really see like this, 
competitive rebuild or anything going all that well. Now they're complete. They have nothing at quarterback. It would have been really difficult to obviously sign Kirk and he would have had to, you know, want to have some sort of indication that he really wanted to stay in Minnesota for another year. And it very much didn't seem like that was the case either. Uh, but, but I think like I liked, you know, the moves outside of that, obviously getting younger, you know, uh, 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 at the edge position, basically, I think in a lot of ways is going to help Brian Flores defensive scheme quite a bit. Um, you know, I like both, you know, I like the, you know, kind of like the, the re-swap of the Texans players basically for Daniil Hunter in a lot of ways, I think is interesting. Andrew Van Ginkle, you know, moving closer to home, uh, getting, I would say maybe a little bit of a team friendly deal from that perspective, I, I think definitely helps them. You know, my, my question is very much like, how do they approach this draft now? And do they need to give up a decent amount of draft capital in order to get out, get up and actually draft one of these top end quarterbacks. And to me, you know, it, it very much feels like not only are they, wanting to do that but they need to do that um you know i i think you know questy giving up multiple year picks to move up in this draft could be a tough sell but i think is one that probably needs to happen at this point in time i do think you know just with the direction where the roster is going to go pending you know justin jefferson extension like they kind of have to do everything in their power to show that they want to win now and i think you know moving up and getting a quarterback it is kind of the one way of actually playing it. And that's kind of my expectation, unless we do see some sort of drop off, you know, of those guys, not necessarily going within the first four selections, like everyone kind of projects right now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that they may have an edge uh, similar to Denver. Like maybe they value one of those kind of sec second tier guys. Maybe they, they have something they like about those guys. I think that the approach that they've had is very interesting as well. Moving on to Detroit, Tej, what are your thoughts about what your favorite team has done this this offseason thus far? <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. I think I could turn it into like another hour of us going on here. So I'll, I'll try to keep this short. I think the Lions are trying to just take multiple dart throws at, at cornerback. So, you know, they trade for Carlton Davis. They sign Amik Robertson from the Raiders. They already have Cam Sutton and Emmanuel Mosley, who they signed as free agents last year. And then I assume that they'll draft someone on day two, um, as, as a corner. So you have five corners. You just hope one or two of them can be starting level, uh, you know, because you didn't really get to that level last year. Um, you know, I, I was fine with letting Jonah Jackson walk for the contract he ended up getting. You know, I think the Lions are in play for DJ Reader. If they do end up signing DJ Reader, they will probably go offensive line or edge in the first round. Um, if they don't end up signing him, I, I think defensive tackle would also be in play. And, you know, I think that they're fine making a bet on the, the low value or the, you know, kind of the low risk, possibly high reward corners that they have. And then they'll, they'll try to fill in, um, you know, some of the offensive guard spots that they're now missing with, with Jonah Jackson gone and Graham Glasgow getting up there in age, as well as some, some secondary pass rushing, uh, next to Ali McNeil and, and Aiden Hutchinson. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that they showed how strong they were on offense this year. It'll be interesting to see how they move with the defense. And obviously they've been pretty exciting to watch in terms of they draft people. A lot of the analyst community says they've drafted people out of order. They, they, they draft not premium positions high and then somehow it's all worked out for them. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how they continue that success in the next year. Um, moving finally into the AFC North, which I think has four teams that has, in recent history have been very good. And I think four teams that are all in various stages of flux and all could be incredible next year, or we, we, we could see a regression um, next year. Starting out with Cincinnati, obviously adding Geno Stone um, from Baltimore. Uh, an interesting kind of bait and switch, letting Mixon go bringing in Zach Moss, who I think performed very well in substitute of Jonathan Taylor last year. For the most part, I think they're standing pretty pat and they're probably going to build through the draft, whether that's offensive linemen, whether that's on the defensive side of the ball. Um, I know there's been a lot of smoke about them somehow pulling a, a, a glory deal for Justin Jefferson and, and pulling off, you know, the, 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 the LSU reunion. We'll see if anything of, of that actually happens. But uh, basically, I think they're they're focused on the draft. And so moving into Cleveland, who's seen a lot of movement, obviously uh, didn't achieve exactly what they wanted to achieve last year with some injuries at the quarterback position. Very, very talented team. Tej, what are your thoughts on Cleveland? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I really like a lot of your points about the the Bengals. Um, you know, I, I think when it looks when you look to the Browns specifically, like I think that the the Jerry Judy trade, which happened over the weekend, is is like a move that you know I'd want to make if I was in their situation. You have limited draft capital. We know how strong the first round of receivers are in this class and, and, you know, especially early second round, like the Browns were, were looking at that and, and not really looking at, a, you know, much of a incentive for them to trade up and get one of those guys, or, you know, they, they knew that they weren't going to be in those spots because of their, their draft situation. So they ended up making that Judy trade, which I think was, was pretty decent. And then they've, they've made some, some, you know, pretty good signings along the way. The Jameis Winston one in particular, I think is, is like something of note because, Backup quarterback is like a very undervalued thing for these contending teams. You have a situation where you have Deshaun Watson, who's had pretty shaky play since returning, um, you know, from his year off and his suspension. And he is entering an offense with decent offensive line, you know, Amari Cooper, David Njoku, uh, Jerry Judy, Elijah Moore. Like there, there are pieces there. Kevin Stavansky is a good play caller. Like, you know, I, I think that they are seeing, you know, a spot where Deshaun might have to, you know, come out of a game, um, you know, because of injury or, or, you know, performance. And then James can come in and add that high variance aspect to their offense, like we saw with Joe Flacco last year. And so I, I like that bet that they ended up making with, with James. And then I also thought Naheem Hines, who, you know, had the unfortunate jet ski ac accident last year, was also like a low value or a, a, a low risk, high reward signing as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see Jameis because if you thought seeing Joe Flacco just chuck it down the field over and over again 40 times a game to really talented wide receivers, now they've added Jerry Judy to that to that plethora of options. And obviously Jameis, I've, I've watched him for years now, just throwing throwing deep balls down the field. It's absolutely glorious. It's fun. And and I'm excited to see, uh, obviously, given, given however Deshaun Watson may, play hopefully we get to see uh optimistic in an optimistic fashion hope we get to see some Jameis Winston uh with all those weapons over there in Cleveland um moving on to Baltimore obviously big name signing Derrick Henry my take kind of was that they have smash and dash x2 obviously they have Keaton Mitchell who's blazing fast running back they have Derrick Henry, who who is a bruiser, certified three and a half, four yards every play. They have Pat Ricard, who's a defensive lineman back there, 300 pounds. A lot of business decisions going to be made if there's ISOs being run with Pat Ricard and Derrick Henry. And then you have finally Dash as, you know, the MVP of the league, Lamar Jackson. Ben, what are your thoughts on Baltimore? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever heard of this smash and dash before. In my day, we called it thunder and lightning, I think was the combination. But I might just be a boomer at this point is what it sounds like. But no, I mean, like, obviously, the, you know, Derek Henry News is going to make the headlines in some ways, like, you know, getting the guy that can win in December and January makes a lot of sense and with, with, the, with the direction that they want to go and the roster that they have. I do think the key is still very much going to be like, how much does Zay Flowers kind of emerge, um, you know, as like a bona fide legitimate downfield passing option? Because they have that with, you know, Mark Andrews, Isaiah Likely, Derrick Henry. Like they are a really dangerous football team and they do have the defensive pieces in place. So I don't think it was like an overly splashy, you know, free agency. And obviously they lost some key guys along, you know, defensive side of football with like Patrick Queen going to division rival you know, Pittsburgh, but I think overall, like, I, I think it's an exciting time to be a Baltimore Ravens fan. And I do think that they are, you know, you know still kind of the team that I think has the most value, um, you know, of winning the AFC North when you kind of look at, you know, the divisional winner odds um, and, and those sorts of things that are starting to come out. They are, you know, a decent size favorite right now, plus 115 to plus 165 against the Bengals. But I, I think that those, they are still the class of the AFC North. And, and I think, you know, Derrick Henry, although, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll doesn't necessarily say that, you know, like the running back, you know, market is back or anything. I do think there is some value in like, you know, understanding who you are and, and kind of pressing those edges when you do need to do that the most. And I do think come playoff time, like Derrick Henry is going to have some valuable moments for this Baltimore Ravens squad for sure. Yeah. Agreed. And I think moving into how, how we talk about Pittsburgh, I think the Ravens have drafted pretty well in, in the last couple of years, obviously they have Kyle Hamilton, who, who was a pretty good draft pick and performed really well last year. Um, 
I, I think what kind of endears me to the AFC North this year is going into the offseason, all four teams could have gone four very – they could have been extremely active both in the draft and free agency. And I think that some of that clarity is, is – some of that flexibility is still there. I, I think all four of these teams can do a lot of interesting things in the draft. Um, and, and obviously – uh, Cleveland has kind of cashed in some of their draft capital at, at this point for for the for Jerry Judy. But moving into Pittsburgh, obviously they pick up Russell Wilson. We have Deontay Johnson outgoing. Um, a lot of interesting stuff there. Ben, what are your thoughts on Pittsburgh? Yeah, I didn't love I would say the Deontay Johnson trade in some ways. You know, the allocation back for the you know cornerback just doesn't make a ton of sense. But uh, it does seem, you know, maybe, you know, in the, in the direction in which they want to take this offense, Deontay Johnson might not, might not be as valuable uh, as if he was, like, catching balls from, like, Mitchell Trubisky or Kenny Pickett, I guess, as opposed to Russell Wilson. So maybe if that's the angle. Uh, but I didn't overall really love that trade. But I do think, you know, they got some high-end play, obviously, from Pat. They're going to get some high-end play from Patrick Queen. You know, I, I do think Russell Wilson for the, you know, the – the cost that they incurred is going to be, you know, very much up there from like a value standpoint from a quarter from the quarterback position. Um, you, you know, so what can they build around him? I think sitting at pick 20, you know, the, the, they're not going to have their chance at like the high end wide receivers. Maybe they get some offensive tackle help uh, in order to kind of bolster, you know, Russell Wilson and his a high average time to throw type situations that he does seem to play his best football in uh so i think that's probably the direction they go from um from the draft standpoint but to me this is still i would say from a roster standpoint you know the clear four or four team in the afc north and i think you know when it's all said and done you know aren't really going to be all that more improved than where they were at last year and i think you know the the, the longer that they kind of try and re you know do this like no, not allowing, you know, bottom out type year, bottom out type situation is only going to like prolong the inevitable. And, and I think, you know, the Russell Wilson sign in some ways is is still kind of kicking that can down the road, unfortunately. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, Russ was a pretty low risk move yeah. um, in terms of just capital, but it could be a high risk move in terms of chemistry or, or, or something like that. Um we have a question here from Eric Eager, noted noted reader Eric Eager. Guys, what are your thoughts on the Titans all of a sudden becoming a house? I'll hang up and listen. A any thoughts so, on that, guys? Yeah, so Eric and I were actually talking about this on the phone this morning, about how we, we love the, the tail outcomes of the Titans this year. And this was before they ended up signing Calvin Ridley. Uh, you know, which happened during our podcast where it's like, I'm, I'm very curious to see, like, you know, if you look at something like expected fantasy points, which like, you know, is it, is it kind of like a good barometer of like a player's performance in general, like even on, on the field, like basically every player on the Titans now on the Titans last year underperformed in this metric, Tony Pollard, uh, you know, was a high expected fantasy points, low actual fantasy points guy, DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, uh, Will Levis, you know, even on um, the, the tight end. Right. So it's like all of these guys could, could have some positive regression this year. And they also, and the Titans seem to be banking on that. So I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about the offense as a whole. Awesome. Thank you. Noted reader, Eric Eager, obviously Eric Eager, VP at Sumer Sports. We, we love all the participation. Um, that concludes kind of our rundown of the divisions, but as always on the class play, we're building the team. We're building the historical draft classes for all of us. This week, we're doing wide receivers. Uh, I'll start it off with some of my favorite wide receivers, given there's been a ton of discussion about, you know, NIL, Nick Saban, obviously great article from ESPN about how Nick Saban decided one day that he didn't want to uh, coach anymore because of how the players only wanted money. And so I wanted to bring up a, a very interesting NIL story years later. Um, one of my favorite draft prospects at the wide receiver position was Des Bryant. And here's a quote from an ESPN article of why he was suspended his year before he got drafted. Quote, a person close to the situation said Bryant will tell the NCAA in seeking an appeal of his ineligibility that he did, in fact, visit Deion Sanders home to go for a jog, train and have lunch. Looking at that in 2024, that that Des Bryant was suspended for a whole season for quote, going to Deion Sanders home, going for a jog training and having lunch is so bizarre. No one <laughs> would believe it. And now Deion Sanders is the coach of Colorado. It just shows you kind of how much the college game has changed for, 
for better or worse, obviously, but it, it was just an interesting thing to bring up when I read, oh, yeah, I, I remember Des Bryant got suspended. I, I, I wonder what he got suspended for. He got suspended for going on a jog with Deion Sanders, something that would never even – would perhaps be applauded at this point in in um, in NCAA football. Another one I really love was Michael Crabtree, you know, dominant year at, at Texas Tech, one of the most fun teams, one of the best games, I think, in NCAA history oh, yeah. versus Texas. Just an abs- absolute monster and went on to a pretty good NFL career, obviously, as well. Tej, who are your two picks for this week? Yeah, I mean, before I do say mine, like, I vividly remember where I was for the Michael Crabtree touchdown, you know, against Texas. Like it was, it was one of those like experiences, like I, I, you know, I don't think you'll, you'll forget about, which is awesome. Um, I, so I have two of them and and they're both like kind a little bit throwbacks for, you know, at least me, uh, Tavon Austin, you know, I have to mention him when we talk about wide receivers. Um, you know, I think in elementary, middle school, whenever me and my friends got computer time, cause we'd get it for like 30 minutes or an hour every day, like that Tavon Austin highlight video was on uh, instantly. And like, we're always watching. I still watch it like once a month, I feel like at, at this point. And so I was so excited about him when he came to the NFL. I still think he was too early. You know, if, if he came out this year instead of when he did, I think that the NFL would be better suited to handle his skill set. Um, you know, I still think that he could have been a pretty good, like dynamic type of, of threat in the league. And then Justin Blackman was the other one from Oklahoma State, you know, and ended up not working out for him either. But he was someone I, I loved in college and you know, was was kind of obsessed with, you know, the, the traits that he had, you know, ended up getting drafted top five and, um, you know, it had a had a career that, that you know, probably left a little bit of meat on the bone, but was still someone, you know, I was, I was really excited on when he was coming out. Awesome. Love both of those guys as well. Obviously, Tavon Austin was an all time, you know, on the bus, on the on the, the yellow dog school bus going to a football game. Boys are getting hyped up, starting to strap the pads on, throw the Tavon Austin highlight film on. You're ready to compete on Fridays, baby. Ben, what about you? I don't know. I feel like for, if you were a defensive player, it would, it would have been more of like a nightmare <laughs> than a dream watching that, I would say for sure. But no, I would say for my, my you know, my dream wide receiver, like it starts and ends with Randy Moss. I think if there's, you know, if, if there's a question, the answer is always Randy Moss. Uh, he's not only my favorite wide receiver, but he might be my favorite human being ever as well. Uh, so I think, you know, obviously I have to have him on my team and then sticking with, you know, maybe the 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 guys that left a little bit of meat on the bone, Josh Gordon, uh, maybe isn't as high up there from uh well well maybe it is as high up there I don't know um but I think you know basically with what he could have provided to the NFL game you know I didn't really get a fair shake so I think you know me I'm I'm all about second chance opportunities and I would love to have him on my team balling out basically because we all know he's capable for sure for sure and l- looking back at our teams uh. We we both we both we we've, we've all collected an interesting collection of talent. I obviously have Reggie Bush, Al Woods, Barkevius Mingo, Des Bryant, and Michael Crabtree. Tej has Tavon Austin, Justin Blackman, Christian McCaffrey, T. Anthony Thomas, and Indomitian Sue. And Ben has Randy Moss, Josh Gordon, Michael Bennett, and Gilbert Brown. So some interesting, some interesting talent, veterans, young guys. <laughs> I, 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 we'll see once we get to the end of draft season whose team ends up being the best. But final word here, boys, who would win in a fist fight? You are a life-sized Eminem. I'm going with me on that one. Tej, who do you think wins? <laughs> Actually, I don't trust myself against this. This life size M&M. I mean, they got they probably have the weight on me. So I'm, I'm gonna go with the MM here, but it's a close one. I don't think it'd be a knockout. We'd we'd go the full full amount of rounds. How about you, Ben? Yeah, I'm with Tej. Obviously, looking at us, we're you know, we're skinny uh computer nerds in a lot of scenarios. So I've never <laughs> actually been in a fist fight before either. I, I I have taken a punch, but I've never thrown a punch. So I don't <laughs> I think I could maybe stand in there a little bit. I'm not sure I could like make strong enough contact to really knock somebody out. So I'm probably taking the M and M, but it's like minus 115, minus 120. It's probably like <laughs> point, I would say in a lot of scenarios. So Obviously, we're all analytics guys. We're all film guys here. If any of y'all need to do some research on what a potential opponent may look like, a life-size Eminem, we can just walk. Come visit me. We'll just walk down to Times Square. There's tons of folks in Mm -hmm. Eminem costumes that we could watch some film on. But as always, thank you for watching Class Play on the Sumer Sports Show. Everyone, please don't feel feel please feel free to contact us on on Twitter and and join the conversation. 
doesn't stop here. Uh, we can't wait to see y'all next week and, and obviously have a good weekend.